You're watching Sky News. We're debating whether football has lost its morals. Did it ever have them? With us now is Amar Singh, digital sports editor at the London Evening Standard, and here in the studio, the sports journalist Natasha Henry. You can let us know your views as well. Tweet us at Sky News, including the hashtag SkyDebate. Text on 84501 or email us news at sky.com. Let us know what you think. Uh, we promise to read the emails if we can't necessarily get them on screen. Uh, and we'll read out some of your comments out as we go along. Before we hear your thoughts and those of our viewers, uh, here's Sky News' sports correspondent, Paul Kelso, and his personal take on morality in football. Football has always struggled with its moral burden. With every indiscretion, whether it's managers sending racist text messages, Luis Suarez taking bites out of opponents with his teeth, players jailed for match fixing. The days of the Corinthians, the 19th century club who were so committed to the amateur ethos that they refused to even take penalties, start to feel like ancient history. And then there's the money. These days even an average player can earn more in a week than most fans earn in a year. And in the last transfer window, English clubs spent more than the GDP of several small countries, and most of it on foreign players. Against that backdrop, there's no question that the modern game is more remote from its roots than for facilities like these in the inner city. But can football really afford to jettison its moral compass along the way? The public reaction to every indiscretion suggests not. And there'll be plenty who think, if you're lucky enough to make your money from playing a game, you've got a duty to uphold the standards that set it apart. Otherwise, what's the point? <laughs> well, we said just before the break, Natasha, that actually TV, there's, there's, a, there's a narrative out there, isn't there, which says TV has poured money into the football game yeah. in, the, in the UK and it's had the effect of spoiling the footballers uh, and they behave badly. There's another view which says actually TV and technology has improved the moral behaviour of our footballers because they, they find it harder to dive, to lie, to indulge in gamesmanship. We've contracted out their conscience to TV directors? <laughs> I think it's a bit of both. Obviously, the, the money that TV has brought into the game has enabled people to have completely different lifestyles from footballers in the 1970s. I was, you make exactly... That yeah, wasn't true, was it, in the 1970s? <laughs> you, you spent your life slogging away as a centre-half and then you got enough money to, to open a pub and Unless that was it. Unless you were George Best, who was a superstar. Now there's just more superstars in the squad. There's 23 superstars as opposed to just two on the field. So, obviously, the money that's come into the game has changed things. But at the same point, the money that's come into the game has also enabled certain people, clubs, organisations within the game to contribute to their communities and their societies and may not have had the opportunity to do that otherwise. We'll come back to that because it's an interesting point. I'm asking, uh, what, there wasn't really a golden age for morality in football, was there? Well, really, yeah, we tend to look at the past with this sort of nostalgic sheen and, and we think that in the 60s and 70s all these players were living these wonderful, wholesome uh, lives, you know, because they simply earned less money. But, you know, I, I'm sure things like drink driving were, uh, in footballers was more common in the 60s and 70s than it is now, for example. Uh, and I think, you know, as the money has gone up in the game and as these guys start earning astronomical salaries, uh, a lot of them are tending to use that money to set up foundations. I think a lot of these players uh, get to a certain age where they think, you know what, I, I want something, I want a legacy beyond my football career and I want to contribute and I want to give back particularly the players who come from more humble beginnings. If you look at the players from Africa, for example, uh, like Yaya Toure, Didier Drogba, Solomon Kalou, you look at the money they've made from the Premier League and you look at the profound difference they've made in their countries to initiatives such as uh, mosquito nets uh, to help prevent malaria, to healthcare in, in, in Cote d'Ivoire, for example. It's, it's profound, the difference that these guys can make. Yeah, very interesting. Lord Oosley, Amar, in 2012 said, there is very little morality in football among the top clubs. Lord Oosley's written a lot about race in football, race more generally. Where do you stand on football as a, as a glue, an adhesive within our sometimes fractured societies and communities? Is it a force for, for social good in terms of social cohesion? I mean, I say that in light of a report that... Uh, an excellent report that Ashish Joshi put together for us three or four weeks ago, looking at how Asian footballers still not breaking into British football. Yeah, I think football clubs have come to realise that it's not in their best interest to be disconnected to the community. They're not just simple brands. They're not like a supermarket chain. People do not have their ashes scattered in the aisle of Tesco's, you know, but they will at a football ground. 
people feel, feel an affinity to their, to their football clubs and therefore football clubs tend to, uh, tend to develop strong links with their communities. They have to, it's in their interest to do that and they do that with their players. So for example, if you look at a club like Liverpool, for example, uh, their apprentices, they won't be cleaning boots and, and cleaning baths of senior players like they used to, but instead, uh, you know, once a month they go out to a homeless shelter and they, and they wear their normal clothes, the academy players, and, and they help uh, people in, in, in the homeless shelter and they, they dole out soup and things like that. So I think it's, it, it's something that football clubs are beginning to understand is a very, very important part uh, of what they need to, need to do. Uh, I was talking about social cohesion there. Natasha, let's talk about social mobility. You know, Wayne Rooney came from the wrong side of the tracks. He's now worth what? You know, an awful lot of money. Well, he you know. gets £300,000 a week, allegedly, so, yeah, yeah, a lot of money. Yeah, a lot of money. So, in terms of, you know, if you're a young, working-class lad, and, you know, this may roll out to include girls in the future, it remains one of the surest ways of, of getting out of the ghetto. Um, I don't know if, if footballers who come from working class families would like to think they came from the ghetto. Um, I would like to go back to a previous point and say morality has gone from football, but I think morality as a whole has gone from society. I think we have different aspirations than our parents or our grandparents mm. did. It's much more about being famous and being rich now than being successful. Um, I don't think football's the only way to aspire to be wealthy, but I well, think... Well, you come to my point, which is exactly that, that I sometimes think the we media, sell this image, don't we, that actually if you want to, if you want to have the, fla the flash car and the flash lifestyle, be good at football, actually there's loads of ways. There is. And they often require something less flashy, like hard work down the course of many years, studying hard. Footballers do work hard. Let's, let's not be uh, cruel to them and say they don't work hard. There's a lot of intelligent footballers. But the point is, because of the media attention, people see what they have and they would like it. And that's why they aspire to be footballers. In the 70s or 80s, it was rock stars. And probably 20 years from now, it will be something different. Yeah, I think celebrities are still quite attractive role models, aren't they, for many people as well. Yeah. David Hallis emailed his thoughts. Uh, he says, I despise the whole circus that is football. There's no, uh, surely no greater misnomer in sport than for fo football to be called the beautiful game. Football is now all about business, has nothing whatever to do with sport. The only thing that matters is winning at any cost. Uh, let's go back to Amar Singh, who's in our Westminster studio. Amar, we tend to focus, because we have this debate perennially, don't we, you know, morality in football, and it focuses very much on the professional game. The reality about football, actually, is that it's a recreational game. It is in schools, it is in the Sunday League, the pub league, midweek fixtures around a five-a-side uh, court, all the rest of it. Uh, what moral lessons can football impart recreationally? Well, I think, you know, uh, football is our national obsession, it's our national game, we are obsessed with it and we have a love-hate relationship with its protagonists. You know, we do hold them to account uh, on a greater level than, than anyone else. And I think that um, if you look at football and you look at the gains that have been made over the last 10, 20 years. So, for example, you mentioned Lord Oosley earlier on and, and, and what he said about morality. I'd also argue that Kick Out have made uh, you know, huge gains in terms of the ethnic makeup, for example, of football grounds. In, in the early 80s, when I was growing up, uh, going to my local football team in South London was... was yeah. I'm not, I'm not I sound like splitting me. hairs, but that's, that's, is that political or moral? I, I probably am splitting hairs, but you see what I mean? There's a distinction, isn't there? Yeah, I think, well, the, the, the moral guides, the, the mora morality underpins uh, what these football clubs have to do. Look, they are brands, absolutely. They are corporations. They make a lot of money and they have to be run like good businesses. But at the same time, the level of scrutiny we, the media, put on football clubs is disproportionately high. Therefore, they have to be accountable for their actions. So, you know, Malky Mackay, for example, was rightly castigated. He's been rightly cast into the football wilderness uh, on the back of those text messages. And I, I would suggest it's going to take him a long time to probably get another job in football because we, as consumers of football, we as fans of the beautiful game, will not accept it. Mm. So I think the fact that we put football under such scrutiny means that it is, it is quite moral. Yeah, and we do. Uh, tweets are plenty on this subject. Here's a flavour. Matt says this kind of thing has been going on on the pitch since the game began. The sport off the pitch has has lost its morals, not on it. Anna Louise Adams tweeted as she says, football's veil of banter, this is what Amar Singh was just talking about, has wrongly given those whose jobs would be made untenable in other lines of work a second chance. Uh, Paul Stanley says, blame the clubs and not the players for big wages. Clubs should say no to players who ask for big wages. I'm afraid that's not how the market works, guys. A player may do something the fans don't like, but a few weeks later he scores and all is forgotten. That's an interesting point, Natasha, isn't it? That we encourage uh, this kind of short-termism, don't we? That we, we look at the behaviour of a player 
and then he does really well and we forgive everything. Um, I definitely think with football we've seen with the John Terry, Anton Ferdinand inter um, incident and Luis Suarez, the prime example, that football fans have this tribal mentality which is... Is that stupid? I wouldn't say it's stupid because I'm a football fan as well. But I'm but not I... talking about being a football fan, I'm talking about that tribal feeling behind it. No, because I think whether you're a football fan or a rugby fan or a cricket fan, you're looking to be part of something. Yeah. And whether that's sitting in a stadium and cheering on your players or cheering on your, your child when they're running a race, you know, everyone wants to feel part of something and I think it all stems from, you know, a collective group, which is what football originally was. Yeah, on that point, parents uh, who've just, you know, sent the kids back to school this week and they've maybe got a choice, you know, does, does little Johnny play football, does he play rugby, cricket? Tell us why morally little Johnny will learn more from playing football than any other sport. There's a thought. I don't know if he'll learn more from playing football, but I know that he'll learn about teamwork. He'll learn about winning and losing. He'll learn responsibility if he's possibly the captain. Um, Johnny or Joanna, obviously. Um, but you learn things when you play sport that you won't learn in the classroom. I think. I know myself personally, sport gave me so many skills that now, as an adult, okay. I use in my daily life. I only said little Johnny because I had little Johnny who went to school for the first time this week. Oh, okay. Best. Natasha, <laughs> thanks very much indeed. Our thanks to Amar Singh as well. This is Sky News coming up in the next hour. David